Good morning, this is Cody Hendrickson. We're going to be doing our AP Computer Science Reviews. We've got the exam coming up here in just a few short weeks. And we want to make sure we have those basic concepts really stuck in our heads. Again, this is Cody Hendrickson, and welcome to my review. We've got a bunch of methods. <clears throat> we've got a bunch of topics we're going to be reviewing today. The first set we're going to be looking at, we have syntax of Java, of course. Methods, something we do with Java on a regular basis, especially on the free response. Arraylist versus arrays. Logic, and for uh, unknown reason to Morgan's, it ties in together somewhere. We have strings because they're kind of a big part. Loops, also a major deal. We have 2D arrays and how to talk about them. And then errors and exceptions, the next thing we're going to be looking at. We also have inside our topic section where we address you know, sorting and searching. They relate together a bit. Recursion, how that's involved. We have the ideas of inheritance and design, two very closely related and very important topics in my opinion. Math, some reason computer science and math have a, a very close, tightly coupled relationship. Now, I know big O notation is not on the AP exam anymore, but the idea of efficiency is kind of helpful, and it's on my state test, so I have to make sure I cover it here too. We also have some special things we want to make sure we address for the AP exam. There are special areas of Java that we have talked about a bunch, but you want to make sure you have them stuck right in your head. A couple no's that we do not want to see, especially in the pre-response. We don't want to lose points. And finally, a couple tricks we want to use to help try and make our code a little bit easier. First thing we want to look at is the idea of syntax in Java. Obviously, we're going to be using Java as a language for this, so keep that in mind. If you have another language you're used to, that's great, that's wonderful, stick with Java. Uh, declaration in Java, we always have a type and then a variable name, just like that, followed by a semicolon, our friend, great, easy to use. For instantiation, it goes a little bit more involved, obviously. We have to use our assignment operator. And so if it's a primitive, aka a char, a double, a boolean, an int, some of those basic types that are simply value only, it's simply the name of the primitive type that we're using, its variable equals, and a value. If it's a declaration and insertion in one line. However, if it's an object, obviously we have to have the use of the new keyword, aka we have to build the object. If we don't use that, we're going to get null pointer exceptions, and those aren't our friends. So object variable equals new type, parens to call the constructor, and any parameters are needed as necessary. And of course, always followed by our good friend, the semicolon. We also have this dot when we're dealing with syntax. This dot is the way we can access internal methods and data members. We can simply use the this dot um, operator to go in and talk to stuff inside the object. Very helpful and easy to organize our code. You'll see it on code samples all the time and might as well be in the process of using it so you actually know which one you're talking about. We also want to make sure we're very clear on the difference between the assignment operator, aka the equals sign, and the equals equals, aka the check for equality on only ints and boolean. But the equals sign is the assignment operator. It's a very polite shover. It only shoves one direction. It shoves whatever's on the right into a variable. You can't shove into a value. You can't shove into a method. You can only shove into a variable. So keep that in mind. The assignment operator shoves just one way, and it's only good for shoving into variables. If we're dealing with methods, obviously we pass those as a parameter, as like a setter. Now, our methods, as we look at that, methods are going to do just one thing well. That's the whole idea. We want to make methods that can operate our code and cl operate cleanly. And so doing one thing well is really important. We want to have the idea again with that, that our name reflects the purpose. So if it's going to add stuff to something, a good name for it would be to add stuff to something. But kind of boring, but you know, it, it, it express what it does. We understand what's going to happen with it. It's very helpful. The parameters that are used inside that method are designed to be used and manipulated. So if you are given parameters, and this especially goes for the free response section, use them. They're given there to you to use inside that method for a reason. You probably have to access them at least. You may need to change them or manipulate them as necessary because they're there to be actually be provided for you to use. But if you're given a parameter, please use that parameter. It's information that can help you solve that problem. Now, going along with that, we also have the idea of a return value. If you are returning a method, aka anything that's not void, you need to make sure that that variable or that value has been initialized properly. A good way to do this is always at the beginning of your method, declare a variable of the type that you're returning, initialize it with a good default value, aka look at the preconditions, and finally, your last line of code, return that variable. Takes care of usually at least one point on the free response for that question. And if you get that done immediately, you're good to go for that. We also have some ideas of method syntax. We have a couple different parts of the method. We have the method declaration itself, where we define what the method is. That has its idea of the header attached to it. That has the visibility automatically that should be a part of it. Public if it's seen externally, private if it's seen internally only. Then we have the type of that, and then the name of it inside there. And so we have, if we have a method that say, for example, is a void method, it'd be public void does stuff, and it has no parameters. So public void does stuff, open and close parens. We have a method that has lots of things. We have public void, whatever it does, parens, and then a whole bunch of parameters that go along with it. And that's the idea of the header for it, where it has the information formally specified. Again, on the idea of the formal specification of that, we have the idea of a formal parameter. That formal parameter means every variable in there has a type, the name, a comma, and then every other variable you have with that. We see an example of that right here with the idea of a method called some method. It's of some type. 
And as a parameter list, it has int first and some object second. So the first parameter is of type int, so it has to have an int expect to be passed there. The second parameter is of type some object, so it expects a some object parameter. We look over the, how the method is used, aka the call. So when you say call method, you write the method name and give it the information it needs. And so a call has an informal parameter, aka a value, a variable, a method itself that returns that value, or some brand new object that you could pass to it. And we have a couple of samples right here. We have that some method again that we saw over here on the left. This time, instead of passing int first, we simply pass the number seven, because seven is an int. We then, instead of passing it some object called second, we pass it now a some object object, a brand new one we created just for use in this method. And so that's the idea. We're calling that some method, passing it seven and some object. And so we see the idea of the differences between the formal header and declaration of the method and the call of that method right there. And we'll take a look more of that in code here in just a second. As you can see right here, we have a sample method right here. This is the get fib member the get fib number method. It's a public method of type int and it takes an int parameter. It happens to be recursive, and we'll talk more about that in just a little while. But we have right here in the top, we have our method header, where it has the public keyword, the type, the method name, and the parameter list attached within the parens. We then have a call to the method, also within the actual method itself right here, because it's recursive, of course, where we have just simply the name of the method and passing an informal parameter, in this case, a variable with a number attached to it to do math on it. So it simply just passes it position minus one. So we have right here a sample code where we can see both the header of a method and a call to method right at once. We also have the idea that we can see the idea of equals equals right there. We have the idea of comparing values versus assigning that. And so that's a couple things we just want to make sure we have a nice reminder about. We have another sample right here for sample code. In this case, we have the idea of a variable where we're initializing a value before we use it. In this case, we have a Boolean method. So the first thing we do is we declare a Boolean variable with an appropriate value, in this case, false. And then we do our associated tests attached to that using the idea of current input dot to lowercase dot contains passing it content to lowercase. Check to see if it matches. If it does match that, then hey, we'll sign it to true and return that variable. In this case right now, we have a value that's acceptable to start off with, initialize at the beginning, and then return automatically regardless of what happens inside our if test, we're good to go. And so this is the idea that we have initialized values before we even get to the return statement. Guaranteed proper execution of our code. Now, the next thing we have, this is kind of a big one, is the idea of ArrayList versus Arrays. And these are the two major data structures we have inside the computer science um, exam that we have to make sure we talk about. There's a bunch of other data structures you may or may not have covered, and that's great. But the two that we really have to make sure we address are the ArrayList versus Array. On the left-hand side, ArrayList, we have the idea of an object that is of dynamic size. It can grow and shrink as needed. And on top of that, it's typed. So we have that lovely little gang sign right there of the type. We have to make sure we always put the correct object inside it, and ArrayList can only hold objects. We have on that, with the idea of that type that we're dealing with that, we also have methods we're going to be doing. Those methods affect the actual ArrayList object itself, whether it's the get method retrieves a value but doesn't affect the ArrayList, the set method which replaces a value and thus changes the ArrayList contents but not the size, the adds which obviously increase the size of the ArrayList, and the remove which shrinks the size of the ArrayList. Now, we also have our dot size method, the ugly helper method we can use to actually see how big our ArrayList is. And remember that when we're dealing with an ArrayList, ArrayLists always start counting at index of zero because everything we're dealing with at ArrayList always starts at zero and goes up to size minus one. So we have to make sure we take care of that in there. We also want to make sure that when we are dealing with the idea of our ArrayList that we keep the fact that it is objects only. We can't put ints in there. We can only put the idea of an integer object, a wrapper class, to go inside there. And so we have that with that. On the other hand, on the right, we have our Array. Now arrays are hipster of code. You've seen my video possibly on that. We're talking about how arrays are hipster. We have some special stuff that makes it different from everything else. But a quick reminder on this, that arrays are fixed size and they can hold anything. I can have an array of ints, I can have an array of cars. It doesn't matter what it is, it's just I can have a defined fixed size of that. Now arrays instead of being method based like we saw on array list, arrays instead are square bracket based. That square bracket is assigned for either the use of retrieving values or assigning values into that data structure. As you can see right here, the retrieve value equals array sub index means I'm taking whatever is at that spot and placing a reference to it or a copy of it if it's a primitive into that variable. On the other hand, if I want to insert a value into it, I say array sub index equals and then the inserted value where I place either a copy of it if it's a primitive or a reference to it if it's the object. Now we have a small difference in the array uh, access for the, how big it is. 
Within our method, obviously in ArrayList, we have dot size, a method call indicated by the parens. But in Array, we again, we have simply just the dot length data member. That public data member access is the fixed size of that. You can find out why it's called dot length because it's a fixed size on that and what it means to go beyond that if you take some looks and stuff. But the idea, again, that Arrays have dot length, ArrayList have dot size. But the biggest thing, of course, is that ArrayList have methods, aka the parens, and we call the methods, versus ArrayList, we have the square brackets, and we either shove in or shove out, and that fixed size. So a couple of things we want to make sure we have ready to go for that. All right, listen, raise, kind of a big deal. Review these concepts before you get to the exam. We'll talk about it again in a bit. Now we have the next one is the logic into Morgan's Law section. The first operator we have to make sure we address in logic is the not operator. It's honestly possibly the most important one because with not and and you can make everything else. But with the idea of the not operator, aka the exclamation point, we can do inversion. Inversion allows us to change true to false and false to true. We also have the power with inversion to change a relational operator. So equals equals, not equals, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, less than, greater than, and and or, all can be inverted to their opposite side. Because the not operator can change all those relational or logical operators to either or. So the relational operators, the greater than becomes a less than and equal to, the, greater, the less than becomes a greater and equal to because it goes from inclusive to exclusive. On the logical operators, we have and and or. And and or are kind of a big deal. They make up a lot of stuff we're doing for logic. We'll test them all the time. And with the and is the ampersand ampersand. You want to make sure on and that you also remember the idea that all. And and all are the same thing. They both have to be true. Both the left and the right have to be true. Now we can short circuit with this. As soon as the left side fails, we're out, we're done. We don't even bother looking at the right. But the idea again with and is they both must be true. On the other hand, our or operator, the pipe key, also known as the double vertical line that's on the right of the keyword above the enter key. Any side can be true, either the left or the right, doesn't matter which one. But again, short circuit evaluation also applies in Java where if the left side is true, it doesn't even look at the right. So on an AND operator, if left is false, it doesn't look at right. On an OR operator, if left is true, it doesn't look at the right. So we want to make sure that we test these appropriately. The most important time for testing appropriately is with nulls. If we don't test for null first, we have the possibility of having a null point or exception later on and nobody wants to get that. So make sure that if you're ever doing a null test, always do that first. Finally, we have the idea of De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law is the way that we can actually chain and combine logical and relational operators in big, huge, mega, huge things. The biggest thing to remember on that is that the exclamation point, aka the not operator, acts just like multiplying by negative one. It inverts things. And so what we have right here in this sample, we have not the quantity of x and not y becomes, because of the magic of inversion, the same as not x or y, where the not operates on the x, the not operates on the and, and the not operates on the not y, inverting each one of those as that one component. So we have the ability we can uh, chain that up and can be really huge things, really small things, but the easiest way to remember how to put that together is that the not operator inverts from one to the other every way through. Keep that in mind, you should be good to go. The next one we have for some weird reason, a major, huge, massive component of dealing with programming is dealing with strings. One of the biggest ones on that is the idea is the fact that Java has a string object built in by type. Amazing, helpful tool. Now, with a string, it's the idea it's any size of from 0 up to n, where n is some arbitrary large number, of characters or symbols or spaces, in fact, that you can put together. And this includes the fun Unicode symbols, so you can make, obviously, all those cute little filey faces you see on the internet. Strings are an object. You cannot stress this enough. Because they're an object, we always have to make sure that we keep track of that and use it as an object appropriately. We can't assume that it's, you can't use equals sign on there we have to, or equals equals on there. We have to make sure we use the appropriate method of dot equals. We have to compare that properly. To look at the, how big that string is, we have the dot length method. Now notice this is length with parens, not just by itself like an array, because a string is not an array in Java. Other languages, eh, maybe, doesn't matter. But in Java, strings are a full-fledged, complete object. They're special, and so we use the dot length method to keep track of it. The dot equals method is how we compare strings to see if they're the same quantity of strings. If you want to check for strings and I'm not worrying about the, uh, whether or not the case, you have dot ignore case. You can add on top of that, but we're not going to worry about that right now. The methods we really have to make sure we hit are the idea of index of, passing it some string. So index of some string says, oh, is this string anywhere in this other string? And if it is, return that position starting, of course, at now you guessed it, zero. If not, then return negative one because in a, a structure, negative one just doesn't exist. So it's always safe to return negative one for that value. We have two substring uh, methods we have to deal with. 
The substring with one parameter means give it in this position, start, go all the way to the end of the string and just give me that. The other substring, start and the second parameter, not including this spot, is go up from here up to but not including this spot. And we'll see it in Java, in fact, a lot of the times we're given two parameters and we're looking for a, a range of some values or doing something like that. It always starts with the one and includes it, but it doesn't include the second spot. Finally, with strings, the method we have to know, and there are others, of course, is the compare to. And this is how we can lexicographically compare strings, aka how do we put them in the dictionary. And so just remember that when you're putting things in the dictionary that obviously A comes before B, Z comes after A, and all the letters fit somewhere in the middle in between. But that compare to is how we can sort strings using that. So we have string dot compare to some other string, and we can see, oh, this is before, this is after, by based on the return value that it gives us back. And that's because it implements the comparable interface, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Now, loops are a huge deal. We use loops all the time in code. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to have a lot of loops you have to write on your free response section. And you'll be reading lots and lots of loops on the multiple choice section as well. So you want to make sure you have a good review of that. Now, loops are designed to save you from writing the same bunch of code over and over again without doing a whole bunch of modifications, aka it's the good kind of lazy. We have three major loops we'll be using inside the uh, CS exam. We have our while, our for, and our for each, and they're each doing a couple different things. Now, I have a couple analogies I'm going to use for that, for the idea on this, and we have the idea of the Simon Says analogy for the first two loops. Now, with a while loop, Simon Says clap your hands, and the whole classroom goes, <laughs> and they keep on clapping because Simon hasn't said stop. And so the while loop operates on that same principle. The while loop operates until the condition is false. So if it is n times, if it's until you actually set a variable to be false, if it's until the um, magic number has been guessed by the user, it doesn't matter. It's you keep on clapping your hands until the condition has been met. In this case, Simon said stop. On the other hand, we have our for loop. And the for loop, by its very structure, it has the initialization, the test, and the incrementation all in that beginning header for the for loop itself has the idea that we're going to say it do this many times. So Simon says clap your hands five times. We have the initialization starts off at zero. The test, are we less than five yet? And finally, keep clapping. That's the step that we're doing. So the for loop is the idea that we're going to clap our hands a certain number of times. However, when we look at the for each loop, aka the enhanced for loop, we have the idea that the enhanced for loop is really amazing. And the enhanced for loop is designed to do things with a data structure in mind. So you have to have a data structure by default. And there's a whole other video stuff about dealing with for each loops, but it's a data structure. Arrays, array lists, other sets of objects. But you have to have some structure of data, and you're gonna do the same thing to every single piece of data. And you're gonna do it over and over again. There's a couple rules you have to make sure you remember. The biggest one, you don't have any access to position or index, and you can't care where they are. And finally, you can't change the data structure. It means you can't add to it or remove from it as you're doing that for loop. Otherwise, <laughs> concurrent modification exception, and you're out. So a for each loop is amazing with data structures to do it to all of them. The for loop, again, is so we can have the idea that we're going to do it a certain number of times, aka a great counting loop. And the while loop is do it until you're done, aka Simon says, clap your hands. And until Simon says stop, you have to keep going. The 2D array is a special, special case. We have it separate from the other one-dimensional array because it's, it's honestly, it's a very different structure. At the very heart of it, though, the 2D array is an array of arrays. So we have to keep that in mind, that, that very basic heart, that a 2D array is an array of arrays. So if we look at name of array subindex, that value actually is an array of whatever type is inside name of array. So we have that, that at its heart. The next thing we have to deal with with that is the fact that a 2D array has two sets of information, rows and columns. And in Java, specifically for the AP exam, we're going to be dealing with a row major order, aka the first set of square brackets are always going to be talking about the rows. The second set of square brackets will always talk about the columns. Keep that in mind and look at that on your test when you're dealing with your 2D arrays because it's honestly going to help you out. Now, because 2D arrays are special, we can't just simply iterate over the entire structure with a single uh, loop. You have to use nested loops on that. So the standard approach for that is loop over first the rows first and columns second. So the outer loop is rows, the inner loop is columns. With a regular for loop, though, you can also swap that and do columns first and rows second. But the main approach, the one you have to deal with with a regular for loop, is that on rows, you go over array name, whatever it is, dot length. That gives you the number of rows inside that data structure. On the other side, on the columns, how many other columns you have inside a 2D array, you do array name sub zero or sub row dot length, so you get the number of columns. It's safe to use sub-zero on the APCS exam because we're guaranteed to have a full rectangular array. 
But on other things, it's more often the case. We want to make sure we use the individual rows. So if we have, say, for example, a sparse array, we can always go to the correct spot inside that and not risk having an index out of bounds exception. However, when dealing with a for each loop on a 2D array, we can't simply say for each type, whatever, colon, the name of the 2D array. That doesn't work. What we have to do instead is the outer loop has to be an array of rows. So for each array of type in the 2D array, and then our inner loop would be for each type inside that array that we just specified in our outer for each loop. So if you're doing the for each loop on a 2D array, remember that the outer loop is going to be an array of that whichever row that is, and the inner loop will always be an object or primitive of what's inside that array. So keep that in mind because a for each loop on a 2D array is a special case. Great to use, but you have to make sure you do it right. And again, remember with a for each loop, no modification of the data structure. Can't add or remove from the structure. Now, we have also the idea of errors and exceptions. Errors and exceptions are the problems we have when we run our code. These are things that happen that crash our program. We've dealt with these a billion times. Everyone knows about them. The biggest one, of course, is our, our great friend, the null pointer exception, or MPE. Null pointer exception is one we have seen a lot of times. We get this because we're accessing something that's not there yet, whether it's because we forgot to initialize it or we simply forgot to call, um, we're assigning something that we haven't used yet or whatever the case may be, but we forgot, basically, the default is we forgot to use new. And so we need to make sure when we're using something, anytime we have an object, we always use the new keyword followed by a constructor call so we can appropriately initialize those data members and those objects so we avoid that null pointer exception. That is the easiest thing to take care of it. The other thing we can possibly do is when we're writing our code, if we, for some reason, we type in public void the constructor name. Java says, okay, great, you can have a, a method called the constructor, but you don't want to do that. Don't give return, a method, a return type, the same name. Don't give a constructor name to one of your methods. Constructors have their name as the name of the class. Methods get their name of what they do. Don't mix them up. Because then you can get confused and you get no pointer exceptions and it's no fun. The next exception we often get inside program is the idea of the arithmetic exception, aka you're doing your math wrong. The biggest example for this is the idea of you're dividing by zero. For some reason, talking to positive and negative infinity at the same time just confuses people. So let's not do it. Don't divide by zero and you're good to go. We have a couple structural errors with data structures. These are actually the same basic concept with either index out of bounds exception or the array index out of bounds exception. The index out of bounds exception works for our list type objects like array list. And that's where we are talking about the idea of where we're talking about the array list either before it's a beginning point or after it's ending point. Same thing with array index out of bounds exception before the arrays start or before the arrays end. And we see that right here with the samples of mylist.get passing it mylist.size. We can't get the thing that's at the size spot because there's not something there. Same thing with that summary.summary.length. Or at small, if we access anything negative, nothing exists in negative space. We don't have some magic pocket dimension we can reach into and grab things out of. So we never pass a negative number to a list or an array, and we never access after the size or the length of our data structure as well. Those are the two areas we have to make sure we keep in mind. Our last set of exceptions we have to deal with is the idea of the illegal argument exception. And this is, means that we are calling our method with something that just it doesn't make sense. The example I've got right here is we're, this method that we're looking for a car object, and instead we pass it a penguin. Penguins and cars are not the same thing. And so we pass it a penguin as a parameter, it's going to like, ah, uh, it's going to crash, it's going to burn, and the code's going to not going to work. So you have to make sure we give it the appropriate type of object when we call that method. Another example is it requires an int, you pass in a double. It has no idea what to do because it's, the double and the int are not the same thing. Doubles have more information, causes a problem. So make sure when we pass the arguments that they're the right type that it's expected to go there. The next thing we want to look at is the idea of sorting our, um, in code. Now, with sorting, it's the idea that we have to have some way of organizing our information. We're talking about data, and we want to make it so it has some sense to it. A, just throwing a giant pile on the floor doesn't make as much sense. We want to do some order to it. So we're going to use some form of comparisons to sort the data. Now, if we're talking primitives, we have the magic power of the less than sign. Amazing. We can sort everything with that, because if it's not less, then it's either greater than or equal to, and we can always make that comparison all the way through. However, with Java, we can't use the less than sign on objects. So instead, with a, when we're doing um, organization or conditions of sorting data, we have the comparable interface. And the comparable interface requires us to use the lovely method of compare to. And by having that comparable method inside that object, we can say, oh, this is either going to return a negative number, a zero, or a positive number. And based on that value, we can sort those accordingly. It's the same thing as using that less than comparison on a primitive, but with an object, because we can't override that less than operator, we make sure we use the dot compare to method and we're good to go. There are a couple sorting algorithms we have to make sure we're uh, fairly familiar with. We can understand and trace to understand, trace to and make sense in our heads. And the 
types are either the iterative types or the recursive types. The iterative types are where we're using loops. We're going to loop over the data structure repeatedly. The two major ones we uh, use most often are the insertion sort and the selection sort, where we're either going to insert in the right pos or select the correct value and then loop based on that, going all the way through the data structure a bunch of times, usually n squared, and that's okay. Or we have the recursive sor um, sorts, where we're going to divide the problem into little pieces, conquer that little tiny problem, and then put the s solved pieces back together. And so on the divide and conquer side, we have the idea of merge sort and quick sort. And those are ways to actually put together more complete solutions using tiny little pieces. AK, it's really easy to sort a deck of cards when you only have to deal with one card. We also have the idea of searching through things. Now, when we're searching through things, we again, we have either a recursive search or an iterative search. The idea of an iterative search, we're going to start at the beginning or we're going to start at the end, whichever one we really want to start off at. And we're going to go check one at a time until we match that. And we actually see a great example of this in the Photolab project in the Intray Worker class. And in that case, we're going to go through and we're going to search through all of the objects in that 2D array until we find the right one. And then we expand that later and we're creating our filters for that 2D array project. And like, oh, is this pixel match this pixel? Yes, yeah, so if we're doing, say, the stakenography project, we can then do that, that swap and we can have the green screen effect or the, hide the image information effect. And that same idea of searching through it, we can search for that correct value and make changes based on that. On the recursive side, we have the idea of using a binary search. One of the biggest ones for a binary search is the idea of tearing your phone book in half because you don't have to look at the rest of the phone book. Now, I know we don't have phone books very often anymore, but if we simply take a phone book object, and for that, I'm going to use a quick little post-it set, and is it in this half or this half of the phone book? It's in this half. Okay, I now have this much smaller packet. Is it in this half or this half of the phone book? It's in this half. Okay, again, I took off half the problem I don't have to worry about anymore. And so every time I search through that, I'm looking at less and less. And so that makes it really easy to sort and find, oh, look, and here's my answer. Hooray. So with the recursive sort, we have that right there. Now, which one should we use, the uh, iterative solution or the recursive solution? Well, there's a couple questions we have to ask. One is the size of the data structure. How big is it? If it's a really huge size, then maybe our, automatically our first choice would be to look at the idea of using recursion, see if we can break this problem down into little pieces. However, that also is mitigated by the fact, is this already sorted? If the um, data structure is not sorted and it's really, really huge, the iterative solution going one at a time and breaking the problem in half when there's no sort, there's not a really um, functional equivalent to it. So it's like, oh, going through one at a time is just as fast as breaking it in half and looking at it because you don't know if it's over here yet. And so based on size versus sorting, we have to make those uh, questions we have to ask whether or not which way we should use. Now, we've talked about recursion a couple times when we're looking at that. We also mentioned it back there earlier above when we were talking about the Fibonacci sequence. With recursion, though, we want to make a little more review of that for that right here. And we have the new hacker's dictionary definition, which says it's a noun. See recursion. So we come back and come back and come back. And it's infinite. And it's just going to go, Bleh. But we have the idea with recursion that it's the idea that we have at its heart a method with an if-else inside. The if-else test is going to say if we pass something, if we have some certain condition met, we will either continue doing recursion or we'll stop our recursion. So with the idea of stopping recursion, that's called the base case. That's when we stop. And that will simply return a value if we're talking a value type method, aka anything that's not void. And so it will return that value and go and, and it then goes back up the recursive tree to any other calls we've had. If it's a void method, it simply does the action and then goes back and does any other actions that were in that recursive tree. On the other hand, we have a recursive case. And a recursive case means we are going to call the same method again, this time, however, with a modified parameter, aka the information we're sending to it. Again, like I said earlier, if you're given a parameter, use the parameter. So we're going to turn that method uh, call to the method with a modified parameter. And then we're going to pick up the answer on the way back down by picking up those pieces we left off the side with those different return statements, which we have a sample of right here. We have right here an, a sample call for the idea of this number. So it's going to method call of some method, passing it 10. And 10 says, okay, now we have method call of 9 times 10. And that, that 10 is the breadcrumb we left on the side, and that which calls method 9, which then goes to, okay, I'm going to call method of call of 8, passing it multiply 9. Repeat, method call of 7, passing it times 8. Method call of 6 times 7, all the way down until we get to method call 0 times 1. Oh, I'm at 0. I don't have a method call for this one to go to negative 1. I just return 1. So 1 times 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7 times 8 times 9 times 10. And so I built that answer up by going all the way down to that base return point and then building out the spiral to where those breadcrumbs I've left on the side, picking up the answer all the way back. And so that's how we can use recursion, that recursion, that going back, 
that times 10 is what we have to go pick back up on the end. And so we'll see that often in recursion. Now recursion is a very powerful and amazing tool. However, we want to make sure that you recognize that we don't have to do recursion on the free response. It may be an acceptable solution, but it's never required in the free response section. Next thing we want to look at is the idea of inheritance. Now inheritance is a huge major topic, again, just like those, some of these previous topics have been, but again, this is just a review, so just a couple things to make sure we have stuck in our head before we do the test. We have a couple major concepts we want to make sure we address. The first is the extends idea. Extends is the heart of inheritance, so we have class A extends class B. That means that class A can do everything that publicly class B can do. An example for this is the idea that mammal extends life form that cat extends mammal. So cat can do everything that mammal can, and because cat is a mammal, then cat can also do everything that life form can. So cat has all those processes and data members that life form has publicly available. And so the subclass extends the parent, always that way, it never goes the other direction. We have access to all public data members and methods. Most data members are always private, so that's okay. But we have access to the public data uh, accessors and setters, aka the getters and setters for us. We can use that stuff. We also have access to the super constructor, Right? These are the call the super. We don't have, we can't call the the constructor itself inside, but we can call super and get access to it that way. And so we have access to all the both the, all the public information and the super class constructor vis-a-vis -vis the super call. On the other side of the inheritance information, we have implements. This is kind of like in, inheritance light, because in, implements just says we're going to have an interface, a set of methods that we promise to use. But we have the everything that now has those set of methods. They're now of that type. That interface is a type that they now match. And so we can have that type in a data structure. So I can have a list of type comparable, or I can have a comparable array, and everything inside that array will have a compare to method. And so we can use that to do some very cool projects and stuff by actually sorting lots of different things. You could actually make apples and oranges both be comparable because they implement the comparable interface. So we have a couple samples right here. Here's the inheritance sample of a, a class that extends a super class. In this class, fa extends soup. And so we have our constructor in there and we have some methods. As you can see also on this, that we have the silly thing interface on the right hand side that the soup class implements the silly thing interface. And so my fa class, which sub is a subclass of soup, has to have inside it all those different sub methods, the fa ingredient, uh, the related meme, the silliness level, and the silly action. All those methods right here are inside it. The compare to method, however, has already been defined inside soup because the soup class also implements comparable. So we have that base class already defined. So you can have a lovely big section of polymorphism. You can have these other things that have that great relationship. So it's this thing and a that thing. You can do some amazingly cool stuff. Check with your teacher. You have some more questions on that, but it's amazingly cool stuff you can do. Now, the next section we're going to look at is the idea of design. Now, this is one of my personal favorites in computer science, so the idea that we actually can build cool things and do stuff with it. And so you want to make sure that you plan your code before you write it. You actually want to think about things first. You want to look at the problem and identify the needs. Now, we're given a solution or a question right here that we want to write a solution for. And one of the easiest ways to start identifying that is start looking at the parts of speech. When we look at that question and we identify the nouns, the verbs, and the adjectives and adverbs, those nouns are generally the objects we have to make, the things we're making as part of the project. The verbs inside that question are the methods or the actions that need to be performed in the project. And finally, the adjectives and adverbs, these are parameters and data nerds that modify, just like they do in English, the nouns and objects that we're dealing with. And so the other thing we want to make sure we deal with when we're doing our design is we want to make small, easy maintain chunks. Don't do this huge mega project. We're asking you to write a little method. So write just a little method. It's just this little thing that you have to do. So most of the time it's just going to be a little tiny chunk of stuff. Write those couple lines, make sure it works, and then you're good to go. On the idea of design, there's a couple things of rules we want to make sure we keep in mind. This is especially for the free response. We always want to make sure that our data members are always private. That's a key concept we want to make sure we take care of, that our data members are private. That's usually a, a point on the design part, making sure they're having that taken care of. The next thing we want to make sure we deal with is that the constructor should initialize the data members. So the constructor should build that object. So any data members you have that are part of the class, make sure that constructor, when you write that constructor in your design question, it initializes all the data members appropriately. We have both public and private methods. Public methods are ones that are designed to be called externally. Read the documentation to see how that's supposed to happen. If it's a private method, it'll say so and follow those instructions. Just use what it says to do and you're good to go. A reminder again that all interface methods are always public. Now here we have a sample of a constructor. This is a CTEC Twitter. We can tell it's a constructor because if you look between public and CTEC Twitter, there is no return type. So we've got that taken care of. We have, as the constructor takes a parameter on that, a reference to my controller object. And I use a, a parameter initialization. So this dot base controller equals base controller. I'm initializing my data member vis-a-vis -vis the parameter I pass it when I construct it. All my other data members, 
specified by the this dot in front of it are initialized as well with the Twitter factor that gets singleton or a new array list because it creates a new object for those. We have those examples of object instantiation because we have that magic keyword new, so we know we're making a new object for it. We have a sample class right here, and so for my chatbot object, we have the idea that we have some private data members, a array list of string, and a couple strings we have to do. We also have our public constructor again. The constructor has the same name as the class. It has a parameter that matches, it signs right in there as well. We have a couple of private helper methods of build memes list and build political topics list because those are helper methods that are accessed only internally, so they just get called with a private modifier on that, and they're happening inside the constructor there to clean my constructor up. But I have public methods that could be called externally on the chatbot object in that instance of it, and so we have the length checker and the content checker that takes a string and returns a Boolean based on whether something matches either its length or content checker requirements. So we have that idea right there. We can see what a sample class looks like, and again, we have this on the test as well, so use them. Now, Java and math. No one ever said that computer science and math will ever be separate, and on the AP exam, that's always the case as well. We're going to be doing math. Now, we want to always remember that the regular order of operations applies, aka please email my data shark. Parentheses are first, then exponentiation, um, multiplication, modulo, division, addition, and subtraction. Remember the modulo, aka the percent sign, do the division, ignore the answer, and keep the remainder. Also, when we do math, we have math dot. Math dot is that magic set of libraries we can do to do more complex math. The ones we have to know for the exam are listed right here. We have the idea of dot abs, dot pow, dot squirt, and dot random. Now, remember, again, you can't make your own math. It's simply just call that method. It returns the associated value. Math dot abs gives you your absolute value, aka that lovely V shape that we use to show that on a graph. Math dot pow, take some base to some exponent. It's always going to be a double. Math dot squirt, take in and put a number in there, dump it back out, get the square root of it. And finally, math.random gives you a number between 0 up to, but not including, 1. So it's always a double value, so if you want to get a random int, you have to make sure you multiply it by that number. Now, big O again, like I said, I know it's not on the test, so don't worry about that, but it's something I have to make sure I cover inside my class. And so big O is that measurement of efficiency vis-a-vis -vis the relationship of items processed to the amount of time it takes to process those items, aka time versus stuff. And on that time versus stuff graph, we, the easiest way to check it to see how much the big O is or how that relationship exists is to count the statements. If there's only one statement ever, just one, it's going to be big O of one. Because it's just that one statement, doesn't matter how many times you do it, it's always one thing. Not very often. We also have the idea of using, it's a loop to go over those objects. If we have a loop over a data structure and there's just the one single loop, that's going to be an order of n because there's n things in the list and it goes over one at a time, boom, 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 boom. Easy peasy. And the next idea is the idea of nested loops. So I have my inner loop that goes over it, and I have my outer loop that goes over it. It can do a sorting. And I'm doing an iterative sort. And so that inner loop executes a bunch of times each time, and the outer loop goes, inner loop goes, doo -doo, outer loop goes. And that's going to be n squared because it happens n times, and then 1, n times 2, all the way up to n again. And so that has that n times n is n squared. We finally have the idea of a reverse or <clears throat> a recursive, excuse me, or divide and conquer algorithms that we're going to be using for that. And those are usually in the order of n log n because they grow so much slower, that nice, really beautifully curved growth that we see for n log n growth. But that's, again, not in the AP exam, but something that my state students have to make sure they know, so I'm covering in part of this as well. We have a couple special information things we want to make sure we cover. Static is a keyword that is on the exam. It may or may not be in a stress inside your test, but static is a special word. It means no ex, um, internal access. There's no state. There's no this dot. You can only use stuff externally. And that's by name of the class dot the name of the method, or name of the class dot and the data member. So it's always going to be something that's publicly called externally on that object. We also have the idea of reference variables versus primitives. References, aka objects, are something like this, my sriracha. If I take my sriracha and squeeze some out in my lunch and then come back, my sriracha has been affected. If I pass my sriracha over to a student and they use it and comes back to me, my sriracha is also affected. However, if I give a student a 7, they have their 7 and I have my 7. They're not affected. Primitives are just a copy of the value. I give you a copy of a 7, I give you a copy of a true, I give you a copy of a false, I give you a copy of the 3.145, and, and I still have mine. But if I give you an object and you do something with it, say for example you squeeze out my sriracha, you lose my sriracha, and my sriracha then level has decreased. And I'm sad. Here's a sample of static. We have our public class IO controller. One of the great things for static is used for utility work. In this case, the idea of saving a file. It's always called externally, so I had to do IO controller dot save file. I don't have to do anything internally. If you notice throughout the code right here, there are no references to anything internal in my state. It is simply just that method itself, brand new instances, and other static calls. 
So calendar.getInstance is a static call. Calendar.getInstance, again, another static call. JabStreamPain.ShowMessageDialog, another static call. Oftentimes, your ID, it'll show it up as a different color, or in this case with Eclipse, italicized. So we can identify immediately that it's a static call, but we can also tell it's static because it has the name of the class and then a dot, not an instance and a dot. All the instances of things, aka my file writer, or file name, excuse me, or chat writer, are internal to that method and are accessed nowhere else because the static method has only what's inside those squiggles attached to it that it has available. Nothing out here in the, in the state level of the class are available for you to use. Couple notes, things we cannot do in the exam. These are guaranteed one point deductions minimum on your exam. You don't wanna do that. So you don't wanna take away points from yourself. So the first thing we wanna make sure we avoid is making sure we don't have any confusion on square brackets versus get and set on an array list. Read the question. If you're dealing with an array, It'll always have square brackets attached to it and make sure you use square brackets yourself. If you're dealing with an array list, it's gonna have type because it's the idea that there's only that type that can store it and so you use the get and set methods attached to that automatically. Make sure you keep that in mind. When you're using an array list, use methods. When you're using an array, use the square brackets. Output. On the free response, you don't want to output to the screen. So no matter how much you think it's gonna be helpful to you, don't. Don't write system.println, don't write system.println, don't write system.println. Those are not gonna help you. It's a one point deduction, so don't do it. Inappropriate returns. Hopefully not the biggest deal, but inside your constructors, you should never call return. Inside your void methods, don't call return. When it's done, let it finish. It just, it'll just drop down all the way through those lovely sets of school goals and exit itself out normally. So make sure you don't return inappropriately in constructors or void methods. That's a guaranteed one point deduction and we don't wanna see that happen. Finally, the idea of bad code. Don't throw code you know won't compile into something. If it causes an actual compilation error, that's another force one point deduction. So if you're not sure, remember, you have some tools inside your uh, testing equipment, aka the test itself. It shows you how to write code that's good. The sample questions will also show you code that's good for that. And remember, you're gonna be using those structures, so look at them, see how to write that good code, and it'll help you avoid these four nodes that you wanna make sure you avoid on that, of list versus array, output, inappropriate returns, and code that just never can compile. Now, there's a couple tricks we wanna make sure we keep in mind for the actual exam. First, the free response question answers are short. This is not some huge mega thing. You only have 90 minutes to answer all four questions. So that means you're not gonna be looking for that. If you look at the canonical solutions for previous exams, we're looking at about 16 lines or less for each whole question. So if it's part A, part B, and part C, it has less than 16 lines. That's not that big. You can write that in the 20 minutes for approximately for that question you wanna take. Another nice helpful trick is math.mix, math.min. Not on the subset, but it can really help you compare values really quick and you're looking to find the biggest one or the smallest one. I've seen a couple instances in the last few years where that's very helpful to use. The biggest and most helpful trick you can use though, the Java language reference that is given to you when you start the test and the test itself have examples of good code. You know you're gonna be writing loops. There's sample loops right there in the code that you can see, oh, here's a loop that does this. Use it, write it down on your, on your reference guide and use it to remember like, oh, here's how the loop works and there's how I do this. You have those brain parts when they happen, move past them, look at the sample code that gives you a good way to do something. Here's the methods you have to know on the different data structures. You have access to it right there in the exam. Use those tricks and have a fantastic test. Thanks and have a great day. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.